I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, webinar on human security and climate change in the Pacific Islands. Uh, as I've already said, my name is Larissa Strinkel. I'm a junior research fellow here at ISDP. We're currently very much drawn to uh, discuss the challenges the Pacific Islands face uh, in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic, even though most of them are largely spared from cases themselves. And we have we tend to forget that climate change poses an existential threat, even though, uh, or despite the pandemic going on. So they're often dubbed the canneries and the coal mines as in terms of the experience they face uh, and that what we might face in the future. So to shift focus again, and to, to um, we're pleased to have three very distinguished uh, panelists today. We have Dr. Johan Bell, who is the Senior Director of Tuna Fisheries International at, uh, of, tu at, of Tuna Fisheries and Conservation International, and a visiting professor at the Australian National University, um, uh, at the Australian National Centre for Ocean Resources and Security at the University of Wollongong. Excuse me there. We have Dr. Eberhard Weber, who is a Senior Lecturer at the Faculty of Science, Technology and Environment at the University of the South Pacific in Suva, Fiji. And we have Dr. Tony Ware, who's, a son, who's an honorary senior lecturer at the Fenner School of Environment and Society at the Australian National University. So we will start with a short 15 minute presentations by each of the speakers before we go into a 30, roughly 30 minute discussion, uh, including an open Q&A session with our audience. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Ware, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Larissa. Um, yes, I, I'll put up a presentation here so you can see. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, we'll now share. Oh, rats, uh, where are we here? Share screen. And we should get this one. And I'll put that up to slideshow, I hope. Right, there we're away. Um, well, I'm Dr. Tony Weir, as the uh, Larissa said, and although I'm now more or less retired with the old grey beard at the Australian National University, I spent many years in the South Pacific, including at the University of the South Pacific, where Eberhard still is. And uh, as such, I had some dealings with uh, Europe, which is part of the point of this seminar, webinar. Uh, because uh, we had a large program of aid from the European Union, which enabled us to uh, begin a program of scholarships and uh, research and consultancy and teaching uh, on climate change for a new graduate diploma. That was about uh, nearly 10 years ago. Uh, now, the picture on the left that you can see uh, gives you some idea of some of the problems that climate change and allied functions, which will present uh, to some of the Pacific Islands. This is a photo of a man on an atoll island of Tarawa, which is part of Kiribati. And he's trying to fight, out, fight off a storm surge, uh, which is coming in um, from the, the ocean and to protect his house, which is not very far away, as you can see, and, uh, and the other settlements. And But he, uh, sometimes there's talk about retreating from climate change up to higher ground. There is no higher ground in, in, on an atoll. And in fact, the other side, the other side of these palm trees is, is also seawater. It's the lagoon. So um, the whole, the land mass is only about 100 metres across. So talking about the Pacific Islands well, as a whole, here's a map and you can see there's about 14 independent countries here, all named, so I won't go through in detail. Um, there's an awful lot of ocean. Uh, this is the, this is, we're almost looking at half the globe here on the Pacific Ocean. And uh, these are all small islands, small population, uh, it, the largest population by far of the island countries is in Papua New Guinea. Uh, the rest of them are less than each, uh, each has a population of less than a million, 
some as small as 20,000. Um, they, and they have very small land areas by comparison, for example, to Australia, which is nearby, or even New Zealand or Sweden come to that. Uh, but very large ocean areas, these white zones here are the uh, exclusive economic zones under the law of the sea convention. And you can see they cover a lot of territory and it's very important. The rights to fish there, for example, are very important uh, economically and uh, also uh, socially, as Dr. Bill will speak about later. So what do we mean by climate change? That's another term that you may or may not be thoroughly across or you hear enough about it. Uh, first of all, we distinguish it from patterns of weather. Uh, that's day to day and also from seasonal variability. So in Sweden in particular, there's a big uh, range in temperature between winter and summer, not to mention day length, uh, but that is, and that's part of the climate of Sweden. That's all part of the climate and climate change is when that is varying over, over the longer term, usually taken uh, over more than 30 years. You average over 30 years to find, to determine what the average climate is. And if you see significant change, that is climate change. Here's an example. This is the uh, average earth surface temperature across the um, land and sea. And it goes here from 1850 through to uh, about now at the end of the chart, 20, 2020. And uh, you can see there's been a big rise in this temperature uh, by about one degree since about, most of it since about 1950 and certainly since uh, 1900 or 1850. That, that uh, pretty much reflects the rise in usage of fossil fuels. And here's another symptom of climate change that um, those of you in the Arctic region will be familiar with particularly as the Arctic is one of the regions where the temperature change is much bigger than the global average. Uh, that's the retreat of the summer uh, sea ice. It used to be out, all out here across the Arctic region. Now it's only down to here. And a century ago, it was it completely blocked. So how does that project? Um, and here we see um, this is the temperature change we were seeing in the previous graph from 1950 to now. And here are some projections going forward made by a body uh, set up by the United Nations through the World Meteorological Organization called the IPCC. And there's a range of projections. They depend on essentially how much fossil fuel is used going into the future. So this is what we might call a business as usual scenario with possibly even increasing uh, fossil fuel use because of increasing population. And this is if uh, countries of the world manage to get the Paris Agreement and its follow-ups really well implemented and essentially the uh, emissions are down to practically zero and of greenhouse gases and you can see that's a bit, that's quite a big difference. This, this temperature rise here is about four degrees Celsius, which isn't, doesn't sound like very much, but that's the difference uh, between four to about four or five degrees is the difference between um, what Sweden as it is now and Sweden when it was under about a, a, a great ice sheet that was best part of a thousand meters thick. So four degrees in global, uh, average temperature makes quite a big difference. Uh, this next chart here um, is shows you the, which I hope everyone can see. Um, uh, no, is the rise in similar rise in sea level because as the temperature rises, the um, seawater, like just about everything else, expands as the as it gets warmer, and that's the rise in sea level over the past century. It's not terribly much, about thirty centimeters, but it's accelerating. And the faster the temperature rise goes up, the 
faster the sea level rise at, would go up and the global average sea level rise on this high emission scenario would be about one metre. And in the Pacific Islands, um, the rate of increase of, of sea level is about double the global average at the moment. So it's quite a big threat, as we'll see in the Pacific Islands in particular, but everywhere that's got coastlines. If you had a, a, a metre rise in sea level, that would threaten just about every coastal city. Um, and the other topic that's in the title of this um, webinar is human security. Just to refresh your memory, if you is that this is not the same stuff as national security, which is a big international thing, all about military and war and all the rest of that. Uh, human security is about individual humans. It's focused on how to, how do individuals feel, and in particular. How, and how are they doing for economic security? How are they getting some money? Food security, which uh, uh, Dr. Bell will talk more about. Are you getting enough food, nutritious food? Uh, health security, very pertinent in this time of pandemic. Um, uh, I should mention that the Pacific Islands, um, uh, virtually, uh, essentially no cases of, of uh, COVID right now. Uh, because the borders are all closed, because they're all isolated. Uh, there's environmental security, which is obviously includes um, uh, the avoidance of uh, floods and uh, other consequences of climate change. There's personal security, which is related that would be very threatened by war, but we don't we haven't had a serious war in the Pacific since um, the Second World War, although there have been a few, um, intergroup inter conflicts, you might say, on a much smaller scale. Um, uh, crime in general is a threat to personal security and in, and in particular domestic violence, which is a big issue in the Pacific Islands. Oops, sorry. Uh, then there's community or cultural security, which is um, threats to the traditional culture or the existing culture of the of whichever group of people you're looking at, and also political security, which is about human rights. And so how does that interact with climate change? Well, we have here um, food security, in the, particularly in the Pacific. We're talking about food security. This is a photo of um, some crops trying to grow on a, on a uh, low-lying part of uh, land and uh, it's been had too much salt water over the top of it and or, for, or pollution from underneath and the groundwater, which is most important in the Pacific. Uh, and uh, that means these crops here are basically not growing. And of course, food security also affects um, Pacific's very dependent on seafoods of all kinds, as you can imagine with all that ocean. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bell will talk more about that. Economic security, one of the big issues apart from the fisheries is uh, tourism. Quite a few of the islands are dependent on uh, international tourists coming in for attracted by the nice beaches, warm warm sunny climate which is pretty equable doesn't change much between what what would pass as summer and winter and also one of the, the the beauty of the coral reefs which is what this lady here is looking at um, the coral reefs are very much threatened by uh, rising temperatures because a couple of degrees rise in the temperature uh, in this in the surface waters here is enough for if if going on for several weeks is enough to uh, kill off uh, the live coral. And that has a big flow through effect. And that would also flow through onto tourism. Uh, other bits affect sectors affected by climate change are the water supply, which uh, Dr. Weber will talk about, fisheries, which I mentioned, biodiversity, and also um, land, coastal land, which is threatened by storms uh, and coastal erosion prompted by uh, made worse, much worse by climate change, and also the settlements. Most Pacific Island uh, villages are very close to the sea. They more or less butt straight onto the beach. 
um, or have done in the past. And so uh, their, their very uh, continuation in place is threatened. That, that raises the issue of relocation where a community may have to move. There's a lot of talk internationally, although less so in within each country, about um, relocation of whole communities. Some, uh, this is a photo from Fiji, uh, this particular village was right on the coast of this rather hilly island here. And um, uh, this, the, the coastal bit kept getting hit by storms that was facing the prevailing winds. And uh, so the whole village has moved up the hill. Um, but that's quite an expensive operation. Fortunately, they had some money from their uh, income from the hotel they own on the other side of the island. Um, that more likely is movement within one's own country, within from one part of Fiji to another, for example. And there's a lot of that going on already in all the Pacific Islands, basically in the form of rural to urban migration, which is usually for non-climate reasons. Uh, or uh, it's driven by for things like people seeking uh, cash income, particularly younger people, also seeking education, and uh, they move into the main town or city capital of, of the island, which is sometimes not a very big place. Uh, but the land, land is held very communally uh, by the local village in almost all Pacific Islands. And so it's already occupied. So the people who are moving late have to put up with much inferior land. And so this is a, a settlement uh, in the outskirts of Suba. And you can see it's not on very good land that bags and mosquitoes in there, I can tell you now. And there's also talk of international movement to um, other richer countries that are not uh, swamped by climate change for the moment. Um, but that's actually very difficult and the migrants are often unwelcome. Uh, so that, that has, hurt for, in, in terms of so-called environmental refugees, that hasn't happened at all in, in uh, terms. There has been movement from islands to some of the metropolitan countries, mostly uh, 10 or 20, 20 years ago when they were looking for extra labour. I uh, should mention as well that climate related hazards are not new to the Pacific. I mean, we talked about man made climate change, greenhouse induced climate change coming in uh, in the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, but uh, well, there's been cyclones around the region, for example, tropical cyclones forever. Uh, and there's a traditional adaptations of that, like biodiverse gardens, building houses a bit higher. On a, even when they're flood prone otherwise, so that they're out of reach. Uh, I'll just raise in passing, there's been a, some discussion about the general interactions between climate change, disaster events and, and conflict or potential conflict, at least tension, which is what we see in the Pacific, but in some places there's a lot of talk that it might lead to real conflict. That was discussed in the UN Security Council um, a couple of months ago. And I'll leave you with some cartoons as I pass back to uh, Larissa. Okay. Over to you, Larissa. Yes. Thank you very much for this very insightful overview. Uh, I would like to give the floor now to Dr. Bell to talk about fisheries. Thank you very much, uh, Larissa. I'm just getting kind of organized here and share my screen. Okay. Well, look, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, as Tony has said, the Pacific Island region is really faced with a large number of climate related threats. Uh, one that you probably haven't heard much about, though, is uh, threats to the great contributions that tuna make to uh, both food security and to the economies of the region. So I would just like to lead you through that. And I'd like to start off with uh, explaining to you why this is so important. Um, 
this map here does a number of things, but I just like to pluck out for you the information on starting on government revenue in these blue circles and highlighted in yellow, you can see the percentage of all government revenue that many Pacific Island countries receive by selling the rights to distant water fishing nations to come into their exclusive economic zones to fish for tuna. And as you can see, this is quite incredible. I mean, the case of Tokelau there, the small territory, actually almost 100% of all their government revenue comes from this source and then down to 5% in the case of Papua New Guinea. But I just, just stop and imagine for a moment, if the government of your country was getting this sort of range of percentages from one natural resource, um, supplying all its tax base, um, or at least making a huge contribution to its tax base from one natural resource, I mean, it'd be in the news all day, every day. So this is really a, a huge thing for these countries, but tuna doesn't only provide a lot of the government revenue. It's very important to food security. It's been estimated that by uh, 2035, 25% of all fish required for good nutrition of Pacific Island people will have to come from tuna. And they already eat much higher levels of fish than other countries around the world. It also provides a lot of employment, particularly in Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, and Fiji. Uh, there are some 25,000 people, mainly women, employed in either processing tuna, or the women are employed in processing tuna, and the men work on the fishing vessel. So not surprisingly, the prime ministers and the presidents of Pacific Island countries, the leaders, have actually developed what they call a roadmap, a regional roadmap, for sustainable Pacific fisheries. And this roadmap's got four important goals. One is obviously to sustain the tuna resources that deliver these very good benefits. The second is to find ways, if possible, of even adding more value to tuna um, so that, that makes even greater contributions to their economies. Increasing ways for people to find employment related to tuna. And as their populations grow, and they grow, they're growing quite rapidly in several countries, is to allocate more of the tuna that's caught within their waters to domestic food security. And look, I'm, it's very pleasing to see that the first of those goals of the roadmap, the sustainability goal, is actually being very well achieved. Just draw your attention to the graph on the left there, and you can see uh, the second very large green column there, which is the combined catches of yellowfin, skipjack, big eye tuna and albacore tuna from the Western and Central Pacific Ocean. You can see that those catches of tuna tower over the catches from the other oceans of the world, the tuna catches from the other oceans. And you'll, importantly, you'll also notice that uh, in the case of the tuna from the Western Central Pacific Ocean, they're all coated green which means that the stocks have not been overfished. And importantly, they're not currently subject to overfishing, which would drive them to be overfished. Now, one of the reasons that this is the case is that 50% of the tuna caught from the Western Central Pacific Ocean actually comes from the exclusive economic zones of these eight countries that you see highlighted in blue on this map. Now, these countries have a group together to manage their tuna collectively, and they refer to themselves as the parties to the Nauru Agreement. And 95% of all tuna caught across the Pacific Island region comes from their eight EZs. And collectively, they provide 30% of the world's tuna catch. Now, what they've done is they've devised this so-called vessel day scheme to manage their collective tuna resources. And the first thing I wanna talk about in relation to this very good scheme is that it accounts for the effects of climatic variability on tuna catch. The maps on the right-hand side here, uh, you can see that under the different phases of um, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, the La Nina and the El Nino, the tuna catch is made in very different places. In La Nina, when the trade winds are blowing very strongly, it sort of compresses the Western Pacific warm pool, which is that area of the map highlighted in the, the light brown there, to the west. And uh, 
The tuna like to feed at the convergence of this Western Pacific warm pool and what is known as the cold tongue. Not actually very cold, but it's cooler water that's upwelling along the equatorial zone, uh, upwelling because it's driven by the trade winds. But look what happens in El Nino. When the trade winds slacken off in El Nino, the warm pool is free to expand much further to the east and it does. And then the tuna follow uh, the convergence of the warm pool with this cold tongue uh, further to the east. And at those times, much of the tuna is caught um, in the exclusive economic zone of Kiribati. So just to lead you quickly through some of the main features of this vessel day scheme. Uh, first of all, as to say, it's a purse seine fishery. It averages 1.4 million tonnes of fish per year. It can be best thought of as a cap and trade scheme. What do I mean by that? I mean that the eight members of the PA have gotten together, they've sought scientific advice to say what is a sustainable catch of tuna from our combined waters? And the scientists have uh, advised them of the sort of quantity, and they've converted that into a number of uh, fishing vessel days, which is approximately 45,000 days a year by Perth Seine vessels will result in a sustainable catch. And so then what they do is they allocate those 45,000 days to the, each of the eight members based on the past seven to, ten, seven to 10 years of catch history. And then how it plays out is like this. I mean, for argument's sake, say it's an El Nino event and most of the distant water fishing vessels want to fish in the EZ of Kiribati, Kiribati will, will sell all its available days to the fleets. And once its days have all been sold, the fleets actually want to keep fishing in Kiribati's waters because that's where the best catches are being made in El Nino. So then Kiribati will approach Papua New Guinea or the Federated States of Micronesia or Palau further to the west where the fleets don't want to fish. They will buy the days of those countries and sell them onto the fleets. And so regardless of where the fish are caught in any one year, each member of this PA uh, receives some income. And it's actually a wonderful, uh, in fact, a world class example of cooperative fisheries management. It's actually a very good adaptation to climate change, too, because it'll, the allocation of days will self adjust because they're made on the, the past um, seven to 10 years of catch history. As the tuna move further to the east under climate change, and I'll show you a graph about this in a minute the countries in the east will naturally accumulate more days and the countries in the west will have fewer days. Now that's, you can argue, is unfortunate for the um, economies further to the west, but it's, the point is it's a pre-agreed formula that everyone agrees to. So there's no, um, there's no scope for conflict here. There will be an adjustment that everyone agrees, agrees to. And that is very different to some of the other things that are happening with fisheries around the world where there is conflict over the, uh, the division of shared fisheries resources as the fish redistribute due to climate. However, here's the key question. I've explained to you, you know, just what a good management arrangement the p &A Vessel Day Scheme is, but we have to ask the big question, will climate change disrupt uh, this scheme? Unfortunately, the modelling that is um, being done, the most recent modelling, is suggesting that that is likely to happen. On the left-hand side of the screen here, you will see on the top panel there, that's the distribution of the most abundant species, skipjack tuna, in the year 2005. You can see that most of the fish are being caught, you know, in the central and western Pacific. Climate change modelling is showing that by 2050, um, there's going to be a change. The blue indicates on the bottom panel that there will be a, a loss, a decrease in tuna biomass, and the, the red indicates where there will be an increase in tuna biomass. And all this adds up to the fact that over time, some of the tuna that is now within the combined EZs of these eight countries that are members of the parties to the Nauru Agreement, the PNA, is going to be found further to the east on high seas areas. And the, this modeling was done about two years ago, and it indicates that about 10% of the tuna will move from the
the PNA waters to the high seas. We actually have done more updated modeling. It's not published yet, so I'm not sort of reporting it here, but it looks like the situation is actually going to be uh, worse than that. It looks like there could be something like a 20% movement of fish out of the EEZs into high seas areas by 2050. Now, this has got really big implications for human security in these Pacific Island countries. Um, the modeling that I've talked about, um, done two years ago, suggested that there could be a combined loss of about $60 million a year in government revenue for these um, countries. And I'm now bringing in two other countries into the mix here. I'm bringing in Cook Islands and, uh, and Tokelau, not members of the PNA, but they're also very much tuna dependent economies because a lot of purse seine fishing goes on in their EEZs. But the second dot point is what I'd like to bring to your attention. What this actually means is that in the case of some countries and the Federated States of Micronesia would be uh, the, the highest value, there could be something like a, a, up to a 15% loss in total government revenue for these countries by 2050 at the very time where they're actually going to need more resources to be adapting to all the other impacts of climate change that uh, Tony has talked to you about. And Eberhard will also be talking about the impacts on water when, when he speaks to you. And getting back to this uh, roadmap that the Pacific Island leaders have developed, um, the movement of tuna from their EEZs into the high seas areas is going to reduce their opportunities to achieve the goals of that roadmap. Just a quick comment on the implications for food security. They're actually mixed. We're not so concerned about the effect of climate-driven redistribution of tuna on food security for coastal communities, because although there are quite substantial reductions in the percentage of tuna expected to occur or to be available in the EZs of these countries, the quantities of tuna there are very high. And even when there's a reduction, there should still be ample tuna for coastal communities to catch with the use of these fish aggregating devices, which are illustrated there on the left. Not so, however, for the urban communities. They depend uh, on their tuna, um, sorry, they depend on industrial fishing for their tuna. When the industrial fleets come into the ports, they, uh, they sort through their catch, and the small tuna that's not suitable for canning and the bycatch often comes ashore and is sold at a low price. And it's a very good source of animal protein for urban communities. However, as the tuna move further to the east, this transshipping activity is also going to move further to the east. And countries like Solomon Islands could potentially be looking at a big decrease in the frequency of transshipping and therefore a decrease in the availability of tuna for their urban population. I just want to talk briefly about some of the uh, policy considerations associated with all this. I think the point is that Pacific Island countries are in a good position to seek assistance to find solutions that's going to enable them to retain the benefits they currently receive from tuna, regardless of the impacts of climate change. I mean, this is really. Uh, shaping up to be very much a climate justice issue for these countries. Uh, as you've seen from this talk, there are many Pacific Island countries that you would classify as tuna dependent. But these countries make negligible contributions to greenhouse gases. So as the fish move from their EEZs onto the high seas, they're going to be losers. And Ironically, the distant water fishing nations, which are the rich nations of the world that have demonstrated their willingness to pay the license fees requested by the Pacific Island countries, they're going to catch more of their catch in high seas areas uh, at no cost because they don't have to pay license fees there. So something's got to be done about this very inequitable situation. And the things that we need think need to be done immediately are that we need to actually improve the climate tuna models so that we can identify the risks posed to these Pacific Island economies with much greater certainty. And that's going to enable them to go in and negotiate to retain these benefits in the appropriate uh, fora, regardless of the impact of climate change. 
final slide, I'd just like to summarize for you the actions that are proceeding along this line already. Um, the Pacific community, the, the regional technical agency um, advising Pacific Island governments has produced a policy brief last year on the implications of climate driven distribution of tuna for Pacific Island nations. This policy brief was used to brief the presidents and prime ministers at their Pacific Island forum meeting last year. And these um, presidents and prime ministers reaffirmed climate change as the single greatest threat to the livelihood, security and well-being of the peoples of the Pacific. Shortly after that meeting, the Pacific Island Forum Fisheries Agency uh, proposed a resolution on climate change to the Regional Fisheries Management Organization, which is the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. And very pleasing to see that that resolution was adopted. And it includes text for argument's sake on the need to reduce the impacts of climate change on the economies of members and food security and livelihoods of their people, in particular, the small island developing states. And a final point to note is that a concept note has been submitted to the Green Climate Fund on behalf of the region by Conservation International and partners like SPC and the Foreign Fisheries Agency and the FAO and, and the Regional Environmental Program. And this concept note that is entitled Adapting Tuna Dependent Pacific Island Communities and Economies to Climate Change. And a key component of this proposal is to develop this an advanced warning system that's really going to be able to pin down the extent and the timing of tuna redistribution so that the, the Pacific Island countries will know with much more certainty what the potential threats to their economies and their livelihoods is going to be from the redistribution of tuna and they'll be able to then use that information to negotiate effectively. Well, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Bell. Thank you so much, so much for elaborating on the fisheries issues the islands face. And lastly, we have Dr. Eberhard Weber. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Larissa. Good morning to all in Europe. Good evening to Tony and Johan, and probably good afternoon to some of the participants. I don't know exactly where you are situated. Like Larissa already introduced me, my name is Eberhard Weber. I'm here at the University of the South Pacific for the last 20 years. I'm an associate professor in development geography. And before I came to the Pacific, I was working in India and Thailand on issues of food security, social vulnerability and conflicts over resources. In the last 20 years since I'm at USP, very distinctively the issue of climate change has been added not only to my personal interests, but also to the work, to the research work I'm doing. And looking into water issues is one of the many issues I had done in Kiribati, in Samoa, in the Solomon Islands, in Vanuatu, and also to a bigger extent here in Fiji. I don't come from a climate change background. My background, like I had said, is development geography. And I also wouldn't see climate change as an outstanding factor that suddenly comes up out of the blue sky but I think climate change is a very worrying new situation that adds to pressures people facing already before the climate change discourse had started, but the pressures on people through climate change have become 
extremely severe. I also want to stress that climate change exists already now. It is a real hazard. It is extremely dangerous to people. Like I mentioned, it intensifies challenges that are around since a while already. And I think we also need to look that these vulnerabilities I will mention in a few seconds often affect the most vulnerable sections, the most poor, the poorest section of Pacific Island societies. And they also affect small island developing states here in the Pacific that have, and I think that is very important to highlight again and again, these countries have very little contributed to climate change, but the countries as well as the people of these countries, they are severely affected by the impacts of climate change and they have very limited capacities to deal with these impacts. Let me talk a bit about water where I can make some issues a bit clearer what I mean. Water has been a challenge here in the Pacific since thousands of years. Actually, those islands that are not settled, in many cases, these islands are not settled by humans because there is not secure water and people for that reason avoid or have left these islands or in some instances they fairly soon realized when they arrived there that they better move on to search for other places. I did some research on the Phoenix Island Settlement Scheme where in the 1930s, in 1938, the British colonial government brought people from the Southern Gilbert Islands, that is the, a group that today belongs to Kiribati, to the Phoenix Islands. 1938, that is just before the start of the Second World War, the people then were forgotten. And when the Second World War was over, they really made enormous efforts that they were taken away from the Phoenix Islands because they experienced for almost 10 years situations where it was almost impossible for them to survive. Not to survive because of lack of food, but to survive because of lack of water. Where these people came from, from Kiribati, I looked into water supply on South Tarawa, which is the capital atoll of Kiribati. And there, it becomes very clear that the challenge is longer than the climate change discourse. Atolls, they usually get, and Tony had highlighted this already, they get their water from the groundwater. Under the atoll, there is a freshwater lens that swims virtually on the salt water because fresh water is lighter than the salt water. And this fresh water is tapped by bore wells people use. But then when the population become more and more, when the usage of the fresh water is increasing, then the danger that salt water intrudes into the freshwater lands is a challenge on itself without climate change. But now as the level, the sea level is rising as the result of climate change, this whole challenge of water supply on such a small place, isolated thousands of kilometers to the next bigger country, 
becomes really an issue when such islands, such atoll islands run out of water. Atolls are particularly vulnerable to water-related challenges because they don't have what we call orographic rainfall. That means rainfall that comes when clouds come towards a mountain range and then are diverted upwards and cool down and then rainfall happens. On atolls where the highest points are just a couple meters above sea level, there is no such orographic rainfall. That leads to a rather high variability of rain. I know it from the Northern Marshall Islands where I just study about a bit more. For example, Bikini Atoll that also has become very famous because of the nuclear tests of the United States. Bikini Atoll in some years, it has 600 millimeter rainfall per year. And in other years, more than double the amount. So the variability, the up and down is enormous and that has a lot of consequences, also consequences when it comes to recharge the freshwater lands. If there is for a couple of years very little rainfall, then also the freshwater lands under the atoll cannot recharge. So these are challenges virtually all the atoll countries, that means Kiribati, the Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, Tokelau face a very insecure water supply. Just a few years ago, there was a drought in Tuvalu where fresh water had to be brought in from Fiji and from other parts of the Pacific to enable people to get just the most necessity of water. And that certainly is intensifying as a result of climate change. A few words I want to talk about where I am. That means in an environment that is characterized by high islands, by islands that have some size compared to atolls, Fiji, but also the Solomon Islands, there I was working at a couple of times connected to flooding issue. So flooding is now not a scarcity of water, but flooding is when suddenly too much water is around. In 2012, there was a century flood in Nandi in January. And then in March, there was another century flood in the same place in Nandi. And during the January flood, the highest half hour rainfall anywhere in the world ever had been recorded. That means here it can happen that rain I never experienced before, before I came to the tropical Pacific, falls from heaven where big rivers have no chance to take the water away in time that flooding can be avoided. Nandi frequently is flooded. The whole central business district is flooded. In 2012, houses were flooded up to the second floor. That means that was really a severe issue. And prediction are as a result of climate change, also such flooding events that often are brought by tropical depressions and the more severe form of tropical depressions of course are tropical cyclones. They come from the north, not like the trade wind from the other direction. And they bring especially to the Western part of Fiji of Vitilevu, the main island of Fiji, tremendous rainfall and uh, people are already talking about to resettle whole of Nandi 
a place that in the meanwhile has more than 30,000 people. I think this month, actually, Nandi should have been declared to become a city. Right now, it is still in the town category. But to resettle such a huge settlement is definitely very different to what Tony earlier mentioned, the resettlement of village communities, which already is a huge challenge. But if it comes to a town like Nandi, I'm not really sure how this can happen. The last I want to talk about informal settlements. Tony in his presentation showed a picture of an informal settlement here in Suba. Here, one of the big challenges is that many of these informal settlements are built into the mangrove forests. That means actually already from their locations, they are exposed to the tidal changes when there is high tide. Many of these informal settlements are slightly flooded, not necessarily the houses. The houses are built on poles, on stilts. That means they are away from yeah, the swamp, the very humid and very inconvenient surface, especially also inconvenient for children who like to play outside and they are exposed. And the major challenges happen when there are flooding events, heavy rainfall or king tides that bring the flood water from the ocean. And there it frequently happened that the septic tanks of the houses in the informal settlement, they mix with the floodwaters and they generate an enormous health hazard for everybody. Just in end of February this year, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, who just won a landslide victory in the last election, Adan, she came to Fiji to inaugurate an activity that is led by Monash University and a big number of other universities and funding agency. I think the biggest funding agency is Welcome Trust from the UK, but also the Asian Development Bank and others are involved to revitalize informal settlements and their environments here in Suva the RICE project, and we hope that this RICE project can, in the next five years, particularly look into water and sanitation issues of informal settlements here in Suva and another town is in Indonesia, that these challenges that already now create lots of health and other hazards to people can be resolved. And here in particular, that uh, morbidity rates of children go down that are particularly exposed to these health hazards. I think I leave it with that. I My intention was to give you some ideas how water in various combinations are exposed, water supply, but also sanitation exposed to changes that climate change will bring and that meet also with already existing challenges and climate change makes these existing challenges even becoming much, much bigger. I thank you so much and I give back to Larissa. Yes, thank you very much indeed for this uh, first hand account uh, of uh, water challenges in the Pacific Islands. Uh, before I open up the floor to questions, I would like to each of you briefly comment on how different perceptions of human security among the Pacific Islands uh, challenge uh, mitigation efforts, because we, we keep talking about uh, the Pacific as a, as a whole, but there will be uh, differences in how countries approach this. So I would like you to each briefly comment on this. Who wants to start? Right, I'll start. Um, well, as, as um, uh, Dr. Weber has emphasized, there's a difference 
in perception in the first instance. Uh, well, everybody sees it as a threat. There's no doubt about that. All the countries are right behind any uh, moves to uh, mitigate climate change because it's a threat to everywhere, including the... Um, the higher island states, because I say a lot of their settlement is on the coast uh, and the main towns are always uh, ports because that's where they started. Um, and, but in atolls, the, uh, the issues uh, as uh, Dr. Weber outlined are particularly acute. So that's part of it. And in some, not every country depends on uh, tourism. So uh, the main ones that spring to my mind are Fiji, Cook Islands, and perhaps French Polynesia. Mm -hmm. um, and that brings me to another difference, which is the political status. Um, the French territories, which are legally still French territories, although they had a referendum in New Caledonia earlier this year, uh, which was close to moving to independence. Um, they are, um, don't need much aid, other aid because they are, they're, centrally funded from metropolitan France. Uh, everywhere else is very dependent on external aid for any monies that they require. Uh, Weber referred, for example, to the Asian Development Bank. And um, so uh, that's, that, those are part of the different perceptions. Can't hear you, Larissa. Okay, try again. Uh, anyone else would like to comment on this question? Okay, I can do a bit contribute. So like I said, Pacific Island countries often don't have the capacities to adapt or to respond adequately to actually a mess that has been created elsewhere the climate change, the burning of fossil fuels, the lifestyle that makes enormous greenhouse gas emissions. However, and here I would hear in the next contribution what Johan would say, I think Pacific Island countries have enormous resources but to some extent, these, exhaust, uh, these resources are exploited by outsiders. So, Johan, you mentioned the distant fishing vessels. And you said the fishing fees are 60 million, the license fees. But the value of the tuna in a year caught in the Pacific is seven, five to seven billion which is a huge difference. Wouldn't it be possible for Pacific Island countries to make more use of these resources and then also be in a better position? I think that would be already a question to my colleague, but it also refers definitely to what Larissa had mentioned, how what capacities, what can Pacific Islands do? And I think what they could try to do is to use their resources instead of allowing others for peanuts, what they pay in license, in excess fees to exploit the resources here. Okay, that should be for now enough from me. Thank you. Larissa, would you like me to respond to Ebhard's question about tuna? Larissa, you are mute. Okay, I think that was a yes. So look, <laughs> thanks for making that excellent point, Eberhard. Um, just to correct a couple of the numbers there, the 60 million refers to the, the loss, loss in yeah. revenue by 2050. At today's values, the, the countries are, are receiving about 500 million in access fees in total. Uh, for, for their tuna resources, which, but as you point out, you know, the, the market value, the landed value of the catch is more like, you know, 5 billion. So it's really only 10% of the potential value. Um, some countries like Papua New Guinea, in particular, have uh, developed quite a few canneries and are, you know, attempting to add value locally. 
But at this point in time, only about 10% of the tuna that's caught in the region is actually processed in the region. And um, there are some good reasons for that. I mean, tuna processing is not an easy process. You have to have a lot of fresh water. You have to have a lot of land. So it means that, you know, it's not really possible to do that in the atoll countries at scale. But certainly there's, there's scope for finding ways to assist the countries. And this is what the roadmap really tries to do when it talks about its goal for adding value to tuna. And I should say it at the moment, because I think this will be of interest to the audience, that um, there has been a big effort in the last three years to take Pacific Island officials uh, over to the um, <clears throat> Arctic Circle Assembly and actually to look at what Iceland has been able to achieve in adding value to its fisheries resources. And in fact, Iceland has now signed a, a memorandum of understanding with Conservation International um, to develop what is known as a Pacific Arctic Partnership. And they are progressing quite rapidly now to develop an innovation hub to explore ways to add value to tuna. So we are very much hoping that this situation will change in the future. And of course, it is one of the potential adaptations to climate change. If it turns out that there's gonna be less tuna harvested from the EZs of Pacific Island countries, but the value of tuna can be increased, it means there might be less fishing days sold. But if the tuna is worth more, the daily access fee will presumably also increase and it could be one way of helping to insulate some of the countries about the loss of revenue from their tuna resources under a changing climate. But it's a, you put your finger on a very important issue. Uh, please rest assured, there's a lot of effort going into trying to change that situation. Although I should also point out once again to the success of the, the PNA, eight countries, if you, if you wind the clock back, um, 10 years, I mean, then the total license revenue was of the order of only about 60 million. In the last five or six years, they have increased the value of the access fees by more than 400%. And so they've been very active in uh, recognizing that, you know, they are the custodians of 30% of the world's tuna catch. And the time has come for people who want to catch tuna within their waters um, to pay the appropriate fee to do so. But on a more general point, it, it, in response to your question, Larissa, I just think it would be good to add that, um, and I think you did mention this also, Eberhard, in, in your talk, is that natural disasters have been quite common, particularly cyclones for many of the Pacific Island countries, and communities have built up some ways of being resilient to climate, to uh, natural disasters. And so there's actually a, a, a combined framework within the region to respond not only to climate change, but to disaster risk reduction. So these two things are coalesced because many of the impacts of climate change are gonna manifest themselves in terms of natural disasters. So that is one approach that the region has taken. Um, the other thing, of course, is that these are small economies. And very quickly, since the inauguration of the Green Climate Fund, the Pacific Island countries have been very active in um, framing applications to go to the Green Climate Fund for the assistance they're going to need to adapt. OK. Thank you very much for elaborating on this. I would like to open the floor for questions from the audience now. And the first one comes from Jacopo Palvarino, uh, who says the small Pacific Island states have huge EEZs, but low budgets for their coast guards. How could they better control their borders to avoid illegal fishing? Do you think there's a possibility of joint patrols? Johan, would you like to take this on? Certainly happy to answer that. Look, it's an excellent question. Um, and really, given the, the size of the economies and the cost of uh, operating patrol vessels, um, we're talking about 28 million square kilometers of EEZs here for all the Pacific Island countries added together. It's a huge area 
these economies are very small. Um, there is some patrol boat activity funded usually with the assistance of Australia and New Zealand in some of the countries. But once again, the, the, the island nations have been very creative and proactive about this problem. They don't attempt to solve it so much with patrol vessels, but they have through the Forum Fisheries Agency uh, headquartered in Solomon Islands, they have a vessel monitoring system where if you're licensed to fish within any of the EZs of the Pacific Island countries, you're required to report your position uh, twice a day. And if you don't, then you know, your license is very much put at risk. And if any of you ever have the chance to be in the capital of Solomon Islands, Honiara, and go to the Foreign Fisheries Agency and have a look at this vessel monitoring scheme, it's, it's state of the art. There's an entire wall of a room that is one big screen. Every vessel is tracked. It's color coded as green, orange, or red. Green means the vessel is doing all the right things. Orange from memory means that, you know, there's a question mark over some of the conduct of the vessel, which is currently being investigated. And red means that the vessel has made an infringement. It's a, it's a superb system and it's working very well. And I think it would be fair to say that the risk of illegal, um, unregulated and unreported fishing, IUU fishing in the Pacific Island region is, is very low compared to other oceans of the world due to the implementation of this vessel monitoring system. Okay. That, sorry, I should qualify that. I should say that that is within the EZs of the countries. It's much more complicated to, to track vessels on the high seas. And I didn't mention it in my presentation, but one of the concerns that uh, the region has um, about tuna moving to the high seas under climate change is that it will become more difficult to police fishing on the high seas. And because this is a sort of shared resource, that spans both the EZs and the high seas, if it's more difficult to control fishing on the high seas, it, it can have implications for the management of the catch within the EZs. And you might recall from that photo, uh, for that presentation graphic that I showed you, that a very large proportion of the tuna is currently taken from the, the EZs of the eight PNA members. And there's very tight control on catches there. And that can be weakened once the fish move into high seas areas. So a long answer to your very good question, but the role of patrol vessels per se um, is not a very practical way of trying to monitor IUU fishing because of the huge uh, distances involved and the small size of the economy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think it would be good to, to get the other two speakers also in, in it. So I'm going to skip one of the questions. And I'm going to one from Julian Tucker, who says climate change is a global challenge which will impact every part of the world. Yet some geographical regions and populations are more vulnerable than others, at least in the immediate future. Given this imbalance, does it make sense to develop piecemeal approaches to raising human security regionally through adaptation and mitigation? in the form of pilot programs that take into account local knowledge, conditions, economic practices? Or will it uh, be a more large scale approach uh, or is a more large scale approach uh, with all of the governments and all of societies more warranted or maybe a combination thereof? Anyone would like to take this one? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that in the first instance. Um, Adaptation is very it, effective. Adaptation is very much locally based. Where the really global effort has to come in is in mitigation. That is to say, reducing the uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. That's what the Paris Agreement and its predecessors, including the um, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, of which it, the Paris Agreement is part, um, or a follow up. My Tony. Okay. Yeah. So um, I was briefly looking at one of the cartoons, which was about that very issue. Um, 
uh, somebody rings up this islander who's already sitting on his roof with the floodwaters underneath and he says um, and the, and the uh, phone call he, somebody answers his phone call and says your concern about uh, global climate change has been placed in a queue to be answered by the first available government that gives a damn about the environment um, but the uh, so mitigation is the big uh, is very much a global challenge and there's not a lot that the um, the island states, the small island states, who, as uh, others have said, contribute almost nothing to the global uh, emissions. Uh, the, 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 stock of, the stock of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere we, uh, that can be reduced to zero by the Pacific Islands and they're doing their bit, but that, that has no impact. It's the big emitters like China, the US, the EU, uh, and of course, um, the big mining companies like countries like Australia that uh, that uh, really need to get on board with the reductions. Otherwise, the whole that's what those scenarios I put up were about. If, they, if that doesn't happen, everybody's going to be in trouble, including all those countries I just named. So um, that's that's part. That's where the global effort adaptation, effective adaptation, is very different in. Uh, an oceanic state like um, um, uh, like all the Pacific Islands uh, compared to say what it is in uh, the Sahel in West Africa, which is also dramatically affected by climate change, but in different, different very different ways. Okay, anyone else would like to comment? No? No, I think I fully agree what Tony said, so I just would repeat, I think adaptation need to be in the places itself and what could be and what need and has to be done is mitigation on a global level, especially the big emitters of greenhouse gases. And there's certainly Pacific Island countries, they can hope that the big players get to turns, but definitely they wouldn't have much political power to achieve this. Okay, but I give back to you, Larissa, because I guess other questions are also coming up. Over to you. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we have one question from Ian Fry. Uh, thank you for your presentation. There are a number of other climate change related security threats. With respect to fisheries, ocean acidification appears to threaten juvenile growth of tuna. This, along with coral bleaching, has serious implications for coral reefs and inshore fisheries. There are concerns that sea level rise may increase contamination of island affected by nuclear tests and also defense infrastructure in the region. Competition between distant water fishing nations is already causing tensions with respect to aid influence within the region. Whether there are concerns about the migration of persons displaced by the impacts of climate change. This applies to people within the region and the influx of people from outside the region. The Nauru Detention Center is a case in point. Do the speakers wish to comment on these points? I guess there's quite a lot to take on, so I'll, uh, whoever wants to go first. Well, I, I might start to just not offering to answer all those very, very good questions, but perhaps the ones related to, to fisheries. And um, I think uh, a very important point has been made that coral reefs are going to suffer badly under the change in climate. And at the moment, um, much of the fish that's eaten by Pacific Island people actually comes from coral reefs. And we have this situation that's a bit like the one that Everhart described in the sense that even if you forget about climate change, there's a, a food security and fisheries issue uh, brewing in the region. And that is that the populations of many of the countries are growing quite rapidly. And uh, so that the ability of coral reefs to supply the amount of fish needed for good nutrition is, is being exceeded. A gap is emerging between how much fish people should have for good nutrition and how much can be harvested sustainably from coral reefs, just driven by population growth. However, the degradation of coral reefs due to um, <clears throat> ocean warming and ocean acidification is making reefs even less productive. So it's, it's, a, it's a double whammy. 
Mm -hmm. But really, the, the region is fortunate that it has this rich tuna resource. And so one of the um, other key activities that's included in this proposal that's going to the Green Climate Fund on adaptations for tuna dependent Pacific Island countries for climate change is to scale up the use of those fish aggregating devices that I illustrated in the talk. Uh, what these do is that they, they allow fishing effort to shift from degrading coral reefs onto the tuna resources because it makes it more efficient for people in small craft to be able to catch tuna. Uh, the technology has been around for the best part of 20 or 30 years, but it hasn't reached scale. Uh, there's no sort of national network of these fish aggregating devices as part of the national infrastructure for food security. And I think it's a very important activity uh, under this Green Climate Fund proposal. So I hope that that answers uh, or provides some indication of how this is coming into the mix. It's a very real problem and they are the plans in place to try to address that particular component of the problem. Thank you very much. Anyone else would like to comment? I can comment on, if I understood it correctly, there was nuclear radioactive contamination. I'm not sure if this was connected to climate change, but of course, those who know about the Pacific Island, they know that right after the Second World War, they were testing grounds for nuclear tests of the United States and later of France and also of the UK. And that left a number of atolls in a state that today nobody can live there. Not only atolls where the tests were carried out, but also atolls where nuclear fallout had broad contamination. What I could see how this is connected to climate change, for example, in the Marshall Islands, there are two urban areas, Majuro and the other one, eBay in Quatchlane Atoll. These are places you couldn't imagine such a population density on a tiny atoll. In eBay, it is about I can only estimate some 45 to 50,000 people per square kilometer. Not that so many people live there because the place is only a third of a square, kilo, uh, of a square kilometer. But as so many other atolls are not there for people to settle there, for example, the uh, bigger parts of Quachelain Atoll, where the United States right now have ballistic testing ranges. A couple of at, uh, islets on that atoll are occupied by the Americans until 2066. Uh, that deprives, of course, also opportunity for the Marshall Islands to create a more balanced structure, population structure that certainly would be required when sea levels are rising, when island centers where many people live no more can carry so many people because of these atolls or islets become smaller. And then there are no other alternatives where these people can be brought to. So that would be my interpretation of the question. And I give back to you, Larissa. Thank you very much. Dr. Ware, would you like to add to this? Uh, yes, I, I, um, I, I'm sure the others do too, but I certainly know Ian Fry, who's been involved in negotiations, particularly on behalf of Tuvalu, for which he's one of their ambassadors on climate change uh, for at least 30 years. And, um, and therefore, he, no one, no one, none of us on this panel are more familiar with the international negotiations uh, on, on mitigation than he is, and in particular, um, how the small island states have collectively um, used their numbers, which you know, there's lots of states, 
more than 50 in the uh, Association of Small Island States to actually get at least some uh, action items on the agenda, including um, the pointing out in the conventions and such the vulnerability and the need for special treatment for small island states, and uh, uh, and and has put a lot of moral pressure uh, collectively. These states have on uh, the bigger countries, but it hasn't borne fruit yet. To be fair. Okay. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, we do have more questions, but I'm afraid we're running out of time. So I'd like to wrap up. Uh, do would the, the speakers have any uh, final comments that you would like to, to give? Anything in terms of policy recommendations or going forward future predictions? If not, yes. No, I can say a few words. I think what is really needed in the Pacific, at least in those countries I have been, is to better connect the macro, the government level, and also the NGO level, even there it is a bit better, with the grassroots level. I experienced so many meetings where people, be it from the disaster risk reduction platform or from the climate change platform, they meet amongst themselves and they can deal very nicely with each other. But to connect to the people on the ground, to the grassroots, I think here still a lot need to be done that then the people also have pathways to inform higher levels of society, the adaptation and the concerns, the adaptation measures they want to achieve, but also other concerns. So it's not only strictly confined to climate change. I think these challenges are general challenges. And I guess they also differ in some of the countries. In some, the links are better established and in others, it is not so good. But that, of course, need to be strengthened if our argument is that efforts into the future should particular also enhance the well-being of people in a changing climate, not only the well-being of countries, then the communication and the contact to the people need to become stronger. Over to you. Okay, anyone else would like to comment on this? Well, I would just like to reinforce what Eberhard said. I think it's critically important and uh, Sorry, all my discussion relates to the fishery sector, but so perhaps I'll just finish with an example there. I mean, you've heard me talk about the need to uh, increase access to, to tuna in this Green Climate Fund proposal. The reality is that in many of the countries, people prefer to eat reef fish. And so without being able to go down to the community level and be able to explain to the communities everywhere that look, we know you love re eating reef fish, but please realize that coral reefs are gonna be degrading and it's not gonna be possible due to population growth and degrading reefs to have as much access to reef fish in the future. And here you have a very good alternative in tuna um, and start to get that message across. And that can only be done with very effective community consultation because in the absence of that, then some of these well-laid plans are not really going to um, bear fruit. And of course, I think this applies to, to every sector. So it's a great point, Eberhard. Okay, Dr. Ware, any final comments from your side? No, I think I covered most of the key points in my introduction about the need for global action. Okay, good. Then I'd like to wrap up. Uh, thank you everyone who participated for today. It was very insightful and very thought provoking and also thank you the audience for for your questions. So I hope that this will entice uh, more discussion in the future and uh, thank you very much for today. So goodbye and everyone else. Yeah. Bye. Yes, well, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Thank to you. you very thank much you. for yes for yeah. the opportunity and see you next time.